Hi, I'm Mike Christiansen, and I thank all of you for joining me at this webinar sponsored by Consonus Music and the National Association for Music Education. For the past while, I've been traveling throughout the country presenting at music education conferences and doing clinics, training classroom and private instructors that are teaching guitar students. When I've worked with classroom guitar instructors, I've found that many of them are the guitar instructor by default. Some are trained guitarists, but the vast majority of them are band, orchestra, or choir directors that have been given the assignment to teach the guitar classes. They haven't had formal training in guitar pedagogy. In school, they weren't able to take guitar methods courses, so often they're insecure in their teaching, feeling like they're only one step up the ladder in ability from their students. In fact, they probably have students in their classes who are a few steps ahead of them in playing guitar. Hopefully these future guitar instructors learn in advance that they would be teaching classroom guitar so they had some time to prepare. Maybe the teacher found a method book that he or she thought would work, uh, though the fact is there are a few method books written specifically for classroom instruction. Many of the methods that are available ignore the principles of good pedagogy and have holes in their curriculum. The next thing that teachers might do, if they have time, is to take a few guitar lessons with the local instructor. At least this could help them with their confidence. So when class starts, our new guitar teachers will try to stay a few pages ahead of the students in the book and hopefully survive the semester or the year. Of course, the students don't receive the music education experience that could be possible. The teachers don't feel great about the outcome, and many times the guitar itself is seen as the culprit. In fairness to most music teachers placed in this situation, they do try to prepare themselves as well as possible, but the training and curriculum resources just haven't existed. The scariest thing about this scenario is that it's really all too common, and many of the teachers who begin their guitar teaching this way may eventually feel more confident in what they do, but haven't really improved the quality of their teaching over time. So if you're worried that what I just described sounds like it might be in your future, then my first message is don't panic. First of all, the fact that you're watching this webinar is evidence that you're looking for answers and you've come to the right place. You can teach guitar effectively even without a guitar background, and I'm gonna show you how to do it. Because you're music educators, you possess the skills to teach, conduct, organize, and present material in ways that will be motivating, attainable, and fun for the students. In fact, you can become some of the best guitar instructors that are out there. Just because a person is a fine guitar player doesn't mean he or she is an excellent teacher. Some of the best teachers I've had in my life were not exceptional players. And amazing guitarists gave some of the worst lessons I took in my life. Of course, I was also able to have the wonderful experience of studying with great guitar players who knew how to teach. In the past, it may have been true that the guitar teacher would have to play at a proficient level to effectively teach a guitar class. But that's not the case anymore. One of the many benefits of the new blended learning instruction model is its emphasis on instructional technology. One use of this technology is to provide pedagogically correct audio and video examples to model the skills and music performances in the classroom. For the teacher with limited instrumental skills, it's the equivalent of having a guest clinician in the classroom every day. Teachers still play in class, but the pressure to perform a perfect rendition of every technique disappears. The teaching sequence and blended learning utilizes video instruction to assist in teaching and audio accompaniment for the practice of skills and musical performance. The old problem of the class not being able to progress beyond the teacher's skill level doesn't have to be an issue anymore. Blended learning solves their instructional problems that arise particularly in guitar classes, such as providing differentiated instruction to the students with different levels of experience. I'll be talking about blended learning in some more detail later in this webinar when I show you how to teach a typical lesson using blended learning. By the way, the blended learning courseware that I'll be showing you is from a course called Guitar Fundamentals, Beginning Guitar Complete, that I've developed with the Consonus Music Institute. Our goal is to raise the bar for guitar education and provide a resource for instructional curriculum and teacher training. First, I'll talk about what you need in your classroom to teach your class, and then I'll talk about what skills to teach your students, and then implement blended learning. So let's talk about what you'll need for your class. 
This may seem obvious, but it's important that the students sit in armless, deskless chairs. We want to position the students' chairs on an angle in relationship to the music stand so the students can see their left hand, and when they look up right above their hand, they'll see the instructor. Wearing a strap will make it possible for you to move around the classroom so the students can see you and you can see them. When you're sitting in front of the class, make sure the students can see you. So sit on a stool or a riser or use both. Obviously, each student will need a guitar. What's not so obvious is what kind of guitar. In a perfect world, it would be great if the students could have matching guitars. I've seen instances when this has been the case. The teacher was allowed to purchase a set of guitars for the class. If you're lucky enough to be in this situation, get standard size nylon string guitars. There are many reasons for this, including they're easy on the fingers, they're affordable, uh, they will hold their tuning reasonably well, and the body size is suitable for a wide range of student sizes. More than likely, you'll have a wide variety of guitars in your class. Work with what you have. Almost every guitar is playable in the first four frets. Every once in a while, you run into that, that one guitar that would make a good planter or a wall decoration, and that's all. But for the most part, the guitars that the students have will work. If major repairs are in order, send the student and the guitar to a local music dealer. Generally, they can solve many of the problems. Try to have all the students playing acoustic guitars. Electric guitars can corrupt the sound of a class where the majority of the guitars are acoustic. That being said, electrics can, electric guitars could be used in ensemble situations or as a solo instrument with the group. Here are some other items you should have on hand. Have some extra picks. Students will be losing them regularly. Have a guitar stand for the instructor. Don't trust setting your guitar on a stool or a chair. Someone, maybe you, will knock it off. Have some extra strings. If a student or you breaks a string, it's good to have a spare available. Even though the string would have broken regardless of who, tuned the, uh, who turned the gear, if you do it, it's not impressive to the student to have you breaking their string. Giving them a new one also establishes a lot of credibility with the student. Don't change the string during class, but have the students come in before or after class and change it for them. Oh, have a string winder. As well as strings, have a string winder on hand, not only for changing strings, but also for turning those impossible to turn gears that some of your students may have. Capos. Because you may be playing pieces that have to be transposed for the students to sing while still using simple chord forms, they'll have to use a capo. Also, if the students play along with recordings, they may need to use a capo. Tuners. An electric clamp-on tuner can greatly expedite the tuning process and save valuable class time. Have an audio system to listen to the recordings of the students or the artists and to use with blended learning. Maybe some recording equipment to record the students. There's no better way to show the students their progress or assess their development than recording their playing. Curriculum. One of the most important items you need to have is a plan. A curriculum and a map or lesson plans of where you want the students to go. Having a core method is essential. Of course, you can have supplemental material, but you need to have a core method that contains all of the skills the students should learn presented in a sequential format. The method should also have integrated ensemble arrangements that correspond to the skills that are being presented. The problem with students teaching themselves from YouTube videos is that the material will be all mixed up with no sequential organization, and some of it is taught wrong. The average attention span of the student is 10 to 15 minutes max on a particular subject. For that reason, don't be afraid to customize your curriculum. For example, uh, you may want to do a portion of the day on reading tablature, single notes, and then a portion of the class learning two new chords or rehearsing a new ensemble. Maybe you'll want the class to watch a non-playing video or review old material from the majority of the class time. As long as you don't disrupt the sequence of the concept, don't be afraid to jump from one section of a book to another. By that I mean try to keep the chord sequence and the note reading sequence and the rhythm reading sequence and the accompaniment sequence intact. But you could skip from learning a new strum pattern to learning notes on the first string and then back to learning a couple of new chords. Most methods, including mine, are written in a particular sequence that works simply by moving left to right through the books. 
However, with your particular class, you may want to tweak that sequence a bit. The layered learning concept in the Consonus method helps to make it less likely that you will want to jump around in the book. That being said, the more experience you have in teaching, the more flexible you can be in customizing your curriculum. So what do the students need to learn? Here's a list. Now these skills are not presented in sequential order and we don't really have time to get into all of them in a lot of depth. So I'll simply present them here and talk about some of them more than others. As I said earlier, help is on the way. With blended learning and the right materials, you'll be well equipped to teach all of these skills. So the students should know the types of guitars, how they sound, and what styles of music are commonly associated with each. This is another place where blended learning shines. As part of our courseware, there are videos demonstrating many types of guitars. The students can see and hear the unique sound of each type of guitar. Students need to know correct holding position. There's always been some disagreement among the instructors whether the students should start uh, learning the classical holding position or the standard folk sitting position. While there are good reasons for holding the guitar in the classical position, I'd recommend using the standard folk sitting position. Many styles are played using this position. It's easier and more natural for the beginner. Students can convert to the other holding position later if they choose to. They should know the terms. By terms, I mean parts of the guitar, finger numbers, and that sort of thing. Students should have a basic understanding of some of their gear and how their sound is produced and how the tuning gears work. If nothing else, the right direction to turn the gear to make the pitch go up or down. They should know that the string vibrates the bridge, and that vibrates the top of the guitar, that moves the air inside the guitar, and the movement of the air escapes through the sound hole. Even that simple knowledge helped the students to understand not to touch too much of the top of the guitar or to cover the sound hole because this, that would affect the tone and the volume, volume of the instrument. Tuning. Students should know how to use an electric clamp-on tuner, but they should also know how to tune the guitar to itself. What if the batteries are dead? Are you doomed? Not if you can tune the guitar to itself. Tone production. It's never too soon to teach students how to achieve a good tone. If they're using their thumb only, they need to pluck the string straight down and even rest on the next string. This is commonly referred to in classical guitar as a rest stroke. The same motion can be done with a pick. This downward motion creates a thick sound as opposed to play, playing away from the strings creating a thin tone. That being said, occasionally for interpretive purposes, a thin sound may be what you want. It's good for the students to know how to do both. If the sound of one guitar is improved by playing correctly, imagine that what that will do to the sound of a guitar ensemble. Chords. Every guitarist needs to know chords. How many are there? Thousands and thousands. <laughs> I have done a blog for Consonus discussing chords and the sequence for learning them. The sequence is what's important. The teacher's job is to organize the learning of chords so the students are physically ready to learn them and not overwhelmed. Of course, open chords should be taught first. I actually saw a beginning method that presented bar chords first. This should be illegal. The guitar pedagogy police should have arrested that author. When the students begin learning chords, the challenge for many of them is changing chords quickly and smoothly. They, may, they need to be taught about pivot fingers. Pivot fingers are those that stay in the same place when the chords change. <clears throat> for example, leaving the left hand uh, first finger in the same place when you change from a C chord to a D7. Chord changes can also be assisted by placing uh, the strumming of open strings between the chords and then gradually omitting the open strums. Another chord changing trick is to play the chords to a song by strumming each chord four times, then two times, then one time, regardless of how many beats the chord gets. This exercise is like running with weights. When the chords are strummed for a long time, for a longer time than only one beat, the chord changes will seem easier. 
A sequence for learning chords could be open chords, power chords, this would include the open power chords, bar chords, slash chords, jazz chords, raise two and three and raise two chords, Freddie Green type chords or color tone chords, drop two chords, and so on. Finger style and pick style. Should the students learn to play with the fingers or with a pick? Yes, both. Because of the ability of the guitar to play so many styles, and certain styles are played best with the fingers, while others are played best with a pick, you'll deprive the students of being versatile by only teaching one or the other. Of course, as students progress, they may gravitate to one way or another, but early on, it's important that they have a taste of both. Rhythms. Reading rhythms seems to be a big hurdle for guitar players. You would think that reading long notes is the place to begin. Actually, it's not. Better to start with quarter notes, playing one note per beat, and then moving on to half notes and whole notes, dotted notes, eighth notes, and so on. Accompaniment styles. The guitar is extremely popular as an accompaniment instrument, and the fact is that many students will use it primarily to accompany singing or another instrument. Here again, the sequence of accompaniment technique is vital. Students should progress from strumming down only to strum patterns and that could be done with the fingers or a pick to alternating bass, the pick strum technique which then sets the stage for finger picking. In styles such as blues, jazz, and funk, comp patterns can be taught later. Reading tablature and standard notation. Should you teach the students to read tablature or standard notation? Again, the answer is yes. While some may think that tablature is the devil of notation, one of its uses is a step in teaching standard notation. By learning tablature first, Students develop the physical means of playing the notes without the mental connection necessary in reading standard notation. Students can play more repertoire that if it was written in standard notation would be way above their heads. If tablature is used to introduce standard notation, the transition is quick and smooth. Tablature has some other benefits over standard notation. Tablature makes total sense when learning altered tuning pieces. In some improvisation situations, there are advantages to tablature. Tablature is here to stay. Like it or not, it's not going away. If used correctly, tablature can be an asset. I think it's important for teachers to teach students to read tablature that has rhythmic notation. That is, stems, circles, dots, and flags attached to the numbers in the same manner as they are attached to note heads. We have done this in all the tablature used in the Consonus courseware. The transition to reading rhythms in standard notation is faster and easier. Styles. I think we owe it to the students to expose them to a variety of music genres. They won't get that on the radio and maybe not at home. They need to become music connoisseurs as well as musicians. They need to know good and bad exists in every style. Tunes. Students need to know how to play some tunes. They should have a repertoire of pieces they can perform, whether it be solo guitar or using the guitar as an accompaniment instrument. Knowing tunes is the application part of the learning process. But so often some guitar players only play parts of pieces or they doodle a lot or they only know an intro. If someone comes up to your student and says, can you play me something? They should be able to. How to play in an ensemble. Playing ensemble literature is an essential component of any classroom guitar curriculum. Students' reading and listening abilities, along with many other music and non-music skills, can be improved immensely by rehearsing and playing music in multiple parts. Music for guitar ensemble is much more available now than it was in the past. We've included numerous ensemble arrangements as part of the Consonus method.
The advantage to having ensemble repertoire woven into the method is that the ensemble music uses the skill or the skills that are being presented in a particular lesson. The ensemble becomes part of the skill sequence that is being presented. If you're using another method, Consonus also has available all of my ensemble pieces in one book, complete with parts and scores. Theory, composition and improvisation. The new National Core Music Standards are placing emphasis on composition and improvisation. The guitar is a natural fit for teaching both of these components. I'm always amazed that teachers don't have their students compose right from the beginning of their instruction. Even if a student knows only two chords or three notes, they can begin writing tunes. It's never too early to light the creative flame. In teaching composition, the students should first learn what chords go together in a key. This can be taught by showing them the chord clock, which is a modified circle of fifths. By taking the name of any given key on the clock and then taking the chords just counterclockwise and clockwise of the name of the key and the chords on the inside of the clock connected to those three chords, you'll have the six basic chords in the key. Students will quickly see uh, keys, which keys are easiest to play and write their own compositions and chord progressions by mixing up the chords in the key. Later they can learn in what order the chords are frequently played. To learn improvisation, students can learn to play the basic E minor pentatonic scale in first position and mix those notes up over a blues progression in the key of E using E7, A7, and B7 chords. But it's important that the students learn that some notes sound better than others. The ones that sound best are the chord tones or the notes in the chords. Chord tones can easily be seen on the guitar by simply holding the chords. Students don't need to know the individual notes in each chord by name, but where they're located. Students can begin to solo by playing one chord tone, a note in the chord, per measure. Then they can progress to learning to play that one chord tone with a rhythm, and then it goes from there. Again, the Consonus method uses this approach and makes it very user-friendly for the teacher and the student. Regardless of the method you're using, it's important that the guitar students learn compositional and improvisational skills. Artists. Students should be exposed to a variety of artists playing a variety of styles. They won't get this by listening to the radio, and probably not at home. They live in a time when the ability to hear the best has never been more accessible. Make it accessible to them. Great musicians surround themselves with great music. How to listen. When I say how to listen, I actually mean guiding the students listening, helping them to be aware of what they're listening to, point out what the, the guitarist and the other instruments are doing in the piece. Don't forget to ask the students what they're hearing and how the music makes them feel. Remember, you're training music consumers as well as musicians. How to practice. Too often, we assume the students know how to practice. They don't. As part of the Consonus courseware, we have an entire video devoted to teaching them how to practice and motivating them to practice. One of the best practicing motivational tools is having backing tracks and recording to practice with. This is all possible with blended learning. Now that we've talked about the skills that the students need to learn, I want to talk a little bit more about the blended learning instruction method and then demonstrate how you as a teacher, new to the guitar, would use it in teaching a lesson. So what's blended learning? Blended learning is a combination of online instruction with audio and video lesson content and traditional classroom teaching using a hard copy book. The online material is used both in the classroom for instruction and in distance learning by the students on their smartphones, tablets, or computers for review and practice. All of the skilled content that I've talked about is presented in this method in a sequential format that makes pedagogical sense. The teacher and the students purchase a course workbook and an access code for the online site. At the Consonus lesson site, the entire course with audio and video recordings, all of the lesson material is presented. This includes exercises, solo pieces, and all of the ensemble material. Some of the pieces are recorded with solo guitar, some with two guitars, some with multiple guitars, and some with a rhythm section. The teacher will show the videos in class for the students to model the lesson skills and play along with, and the students will practice outside of the class accessing the same material on their phone, computer, or tablet. Imagine how much more motivating and productive and fun practice is when playing along with the accompaniment tracks. 
There are videos that uh, students will review for every skill taught in the course. All the online material is presented in the same lesson structure as the workbook, so the classroom instruction mirrors the online instruction. This is not designated to replace the instructor, but add a second witness to what they're teaching and also supply a high quality level of performance for the students to hear and observe. There is also supplemental material in video form that makes it easy to expose the students to non-playing skills and knowledge such as tuning, how to practice, types of the guitars, and more. Regardless of your playing proficiency on the guitar, all teachers should use audio-video material in their classroom instruction. The classroom instruction method intentionally includes sequences of using this material in your teaching so that students will know how to access and use that same material to review and practice in their homework sessions outside of class. The use of blended learning makes the teacher's job much more comfortable and also provides a high uh, level standard for the students to achieve. Here's a few more features of the Consonus Blended Learning System. Layered learning. Each lesson contains a layered learning section with material that can be assigned for the more advanced students in the class. This way, every student in the class can play the same repertoire but at different levels. None of the students are bored and none are overwhelmed. Academic blending learning systems use this approach to deliver differentiated or customized instruction to the students. In a beginning class where students range from not having touched the instrument to having had lessons previously, this is the best way to uh, level the playing field, keep the class engaged and moving at the same pace. Teacher training. There are also teacher training videos available at the teacher uh, pedagogy area of the Consona site where the teacher can learn how to present the skills. The blended learning material with the teacher training component will not only improve the quality of instruction, but also the teacher's ability to perform the material. To show you how you can effectively teach some of the material I've been mentioning using blended learning, I'd like to take you through one lesson class period and talk about um, how to structure it. You all know that the average attention span on any one given topic is 10 to 15 minutes at the most. Given that, it's important that your class period be divided into several sections. It's also important that you only present a small amount of new material, maybe only one new concept in the class period. In fact, there may be many class periods where you won't present anything new, but you'll spend the entire time reviewing old material or going over non-playing topics, such as how to practice or the types of guitars. When the kids arrive, you will no doubt have some business to take care of at the beginning of class, like taking the role, reminding the students of upcoming events, and that sort of thing. You may want to talk about what you'll be doing that day before the students get their guitars out. I've even seen teachers have the students play air guitar to a recording of the piece they've been learning before they even get their guitars. After the students get their guitars, check the tuning. This could be done quickly with an electric, uh, electric clamp-on tuner. You could even tune each of the guitars in the beginning until the students learn how to tune them. Next, do some kind of warm-up, like walking the fingerboard or a basic chord exercise. The warm-up could also consist of some simple exercises from early in the book. After doing the warm-up, review some material from previous lessons. These could be solos or exercises the students are comfortable playing. With blended learning, the students could play along with a video or a piece from the earlier section of the book. Let's suppose today that the new skill we're learning is how to play the notes on the first string, or the notes on strings one and two, depending on how fast the students catch on to it. These notes are found in lesson 18 and 19. We have already gone over how to read standard notation the names of the lines and spaces and note placement in a previous class. Before we learn the new notes, let's go back to Lesson 7 and play Me Too. That primarily uses tablature on two strings with an occasional note on the third string. This is important because our note reading will be an outgrowth of playing tablature. So we listen to the recording of Me Too. Then we'll play with the recording, and then we'll play without the recording. 
We'll then do that same sequence with Spanish Trio to review an ensemble piece. Next, we'll play Will the Circle Be Unbroken to review some basic chords. By and by, Lord, by and by. We might even want to apply the strum pattern from Lesson 7 to Will the Circle Be Unbroken. After that review, we'll go to Lesson 18 and learn the three notes on the first string. I'll explain where the notes are located to the students and then let them watch the blended learning video where the note placements are explained. Then we'll watch and listen to the video of exercise one. Next, we'll play with the video. This video has accompaniment that the teacher may not be able to play. Finally, we'll play the exercise without the video. This same process can be followed with all of the exercises and solos. Some of the exercises that combine notes on more than one string could be considered solo pieces. Remember the important sequence of learning a new skill, which is present the skill, drill or repeatedly play the exercise, and then apply the skill in a solo or performance piece. After we've gone over the new material, time permitting, the class can go back and review some earlier music they've learned. This sandwich method of lesson construction, that is, the new material sandwiched in between some familiar material is the same format that the students should use in their practicing. Not only are you teaching them performance skills, but you're also teaching them the lifelong skill of how to practice. Near the end of the period, remember to challenge the students and give them a quick review of what they've learned that day and give them the assignment of what they need to practice for their homework. You should also tell them that you expect them to use the blended learning lesson content and practice with, with it in the same way that it was presented in class. By the way, one of the learning management features of the Consonus Online Lesson Site is that it allows the teacher to monitor the lessons that each student has accessed and the number of times the material has been viewed. This coupled with online practice logs is a great way to keep the students accountable for their practice. Obviously, there's not enough time here to go into every aspect and detail of what it takes to be a successful guitar educator. But hopefully, you've picked up on some ideas that will make you more comfortable in your teaching. As I said before, don't panic. This is very doable. We at Consonus would like to help. If you're interested in getting into those topics in more detail and learning more about guitar pedagogy, I would hope you'd be interested in attending or hosting a workshop in your area. These workshops range from two hours to three days and provide loads of material and information to assist you in your teaching. Many of these workshops have already been booked. To find the locations and see if one is near you or if you're interested in hosting a workshop, go to cmilearn.org and contact us.